C.S. Lewis is a, was a great uh, theological thinker and author, and he said this, There is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. You may be aware that your enemy, that your soul has an enemy. You may be aware that you have one, but do you know your enemy? The ancient Chinese general, I think you may have heard this uh, statement that he wrote in The Art of War. He said this, Know thy enemy and know yourself. In a hundred battles, you will never be defeated. When you are ignorant of the enemy but know yourself, your chances of winning or losing are equal. If ignorant of both your enemy and of yourself, you are sure to be defeated in every battle. When you think of overcoming temptation, what do you think? I don't know if you've ever heard of a kitchen safe, but there is an invention now where you can get a Tupperware, a, a container for your kitchen that has a safe timer on it so that you can lock away things that you are tempted to eat before dinner. <laughs> so you can put it in there and you can set a timer that it will only release at 7.30 so that you can resist temptation. We had a, a friend, Richard and I had a friend once who as a teenager, uh, he was dating a girl and the two of them were Christians and they found themselves in a room on their own. Her parents had left the home, they were watching a movie and they were sitting very close and their hearts started racing a little bit faster than they should. And as they sat there, they realized that things were getting a bit heated. And so this teenage boy, <laughs> jumped over the back of the couch, ran out the front door and all the way home, and then phoned his girlfriend and said, sorry, the, devil says, the Bible says we must flee from temptation. <laughs> We're called to know our enemy, but sometimes I think that when we think of temptation, we think that it's going to be obvious. It's obvious. It was obvious to that teenage boy that he was in a situation that he was being tempted. It's obvious to us when we open the fridge just before dinner that we are being tempted. But our enemy, the enemy of our soul, plays dirty. And I don't think we always realize that. We have since found out, many years after the Cold War, some of the tactics that Russia used in order to confuse those in the West. And what they did is the KGB intentionally planted Russian spies into the West in entertainment, uh, media, all sorts of areas where they would flood the West with information that was just wrong and noisy. They called their tactic disinformatia, and it entered the English language as the word disinformation. And their point was not necessarily to, uh, to spread an agenda, but just to confuse the West and to throw it off balance enough that they wouldn't notice what was going on behind the Iron Curtain. That's scary stuff. R a Russian world champion chess player explained it like this. The point of the propaganda wasn't only to misinform or to push an agenda, it was to exhaust critical thinking and to annihilate truth. Now that is a good metaphor for the way our enemy fights. To exhaust our critical thinking and to annihilate truth. We've just finished a series on Jesus and who he is, the I Am series, and things that Jesus is uniquely, things that he is that we, will, we are not trying to be, we can benefit from who he is. He is the light of the world. He is the bread of life. He is the way, the truth, and the life, the good shepherd. But in addition to being the way, the way, Jesus was also a way maker. And it's that that we want to, uh, to speak about in the next few weeks, is how Jesus made a way as a human to show us how to be more human, how to be, how to be better humans, how to live into the humanity that was meant for us. Often we say something can never be done until it's been done. It was, it was impossible for a man to run a sub 10 second 100 meters until the first person did, and then it became possible. 
It was impossible for man to run a sub four minute mile until he did, and then it became possible. Christopher Columbus was famous for uh, finding a way, a route across the Atlantic Ocean to the West Indies and discovering the Americas that way. And afterwards, he was at a dinner with a bunch of Spaniards, and they were saying, well, you know, Mr. Christopher, in all fairness, if you hadn't done it, somebody would have done it. Uh, it, was, it was going to be done because we were are in the age of discovery, and you know, our ships are at that level. And so Christopher Columbus ordered a boiled egg to the table. And he said, he passed the egg around the table, and he said to the nobleman that he was having dinner with, I bet none of you can balance this egg on its end. And they passed it around, and everybody laughed, and they tried, and became a fun thing in the evening, until it came to him. And they said, it's impossible. We've all tried. And so Columbus just smashed lightly the egg onto the table, crushed the bottom of the egg, and stood it up on a flat surface. And everybody said, ah, oh, and they realized that their argument that now that they'd seen it done, <laughs> they could also do it, held no weight, because that was his point. Once something has been done, it's much easier for others to do it. And Jesus has come not only as the way, but also as a way maker to show us how humanity can be done by us. So Jesus' first appearance in the scriptures uh, since his childhood was at his baptism. And at his baptism by John the baptizer, uh, he comes up out of the water and he is affirmed by his Father in heaven who says, this is my son whom I love and with whom I'm well pleased. And straight from that moment, he is led, uh, driven, compelled by the Spirit out into the wilderness for a 40-day fast and then a showdown with the enemy of his soul. And I would like to read it with, to you. It's from Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And then the devil left him for an opportune time. So we're going to break this up into three parts as we look at how Jesus overcame temptation in this part. And the first uh, section that I would like to look at is the devil's strategy. So we understand that truth, truth is reality. Uh, there was a big rugby match next door, rugby matches next door, Northwood versus Hilton. And wow, on the side of the field, there's most definitely my truth, your truth, his truth, her truth, right? until you watch the replay. And when you watch the replay, you can see the reality, and that's truth. Lies correspond to unreality, uh, a, a false reality, our version that we'd like to pretend is reality, but is not reality. So truth is reality, lies is unreality. And in this, uh, the way that our minds work is ideas come to us, Reality or unreality, just ideas at this point. And they create in our minds these mental maps of how the world works. So if you uh, think even just of the way from here to your home, you would have a mental map. And you could describe somebody, go up McKeerton, turn left at the robots. And you can give them a, a map mentally that if they follow that map, if it corresponds to reality, then following that map will get them to where they're trying to go. And so that is what uh, the mental maps are that we create, and we create these for ourselves. And when our mental maps correspond well with reality, 
then we tend to live into lives that thrive. When we have a mental map about marriage that is true, that corresponds to reality, we thrive. A mental map about parenting, about how we should care for our bodies, about how we should engage with our spirituality. When our mental maps are true and correspond with reality, we thrive. When they are untrue and do not correspond with reality, then we tend to struggle through life, much as you would struggle if I gave you incorrect directions from here to where you wanted to go. So if we are to understand the devil's techniques, we need to to read the Bible that gives us a, a reality, a mental map about what he's like. So Jesus calls the devil the father of lies. And he says in John 8, uh, this is during that time when he's in, the, in Jerusalem and all those I am statements, that week that he's in Jerusalem that we've been preaching about. And Jesus says this, He, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And he's, he's referring Jesus to Genesis 3. In the beginning, the story of Adam and Eve, which those listening to him knew that story, that the devil, the enemy of our soul, came disguised as a talking snake to lie to Eve. And he uh, lied to her by twisting the truth. The best lies are a version of reality that's just twisted slightly, right? I mean, in the rugby tackle yesterday, the tackle was late, right? And it was late. And the tackle was on purpose. It was assault, right? But it didn't look like it was on purpose. So it was close. It's close to reality, but it's not quite reality. And the devil comes with those kind of lies. He says to her, did God really say that you can't eat of any tree in the garden, which was, of course, not, not the truth. It was just one specific tree that God had asked Adam and Eve not to eat from. And you notice something else, that when the devil came and, uh, and con confronted Eve, she was alone. She was isolated. And this is the devil's tactic. You see, Jesus taught us that it was by spirit and truth that we are transformed into the image of Jesus. And it's the opposite, it's by isolation and lies that were deformed by the devil. So he got Eve alone. That was intentional, so there was no counterpoint of truth that would mitigate his lies. He doesn't want us to, to think that maybe we should be swayed this way. The more isolated we are, the better for him, the better for us to believe his lies. We need to either be confused <laughs> or isolated in order for those lies to slip in. Because if we saw them clearly, then we wouldn't be so easily fooled by them. And then secondly, he came at her with an idea. It was just an idea. Surely you won't die. Just an idea, a lie about reality. Surely you won't die. It was subtle and partly true. You'll become like God, he said, knowing good and evil. You'll have wisdom. You'll have autonomy from God. You'll be empowered. These were things that notice played into her desires. They were things that she actually did want. She wanted to be wise. She was hungry. She wanted to eat the fruit. It looked good. And so there were things that she actually wanted. The devil's not going to tempt us with things that are maybe classic temptations that we think of, but are not things that we are tempted by. So often we look at the people next to us and we think, yeah, I'm so glad I'm not tempted by that. The devil won't come to you with somebody else's temptations. The devil won't come to you with desires that you don't have and try and tempt you with that because he's not, he's not a fool. So we need to know the enemy, but we also need to know ourselves. What are the things that we want? What are the things that we need? What are the things that we're craving? What are those things that would be our desires that are disordered? John Mark Homer explains the tactics of the enemy like this. He comes with deceptive ideas. They're off a little bit. But those ideas play into our disordered desires. And when I say disordered desires, they're not bad desires. There are desires that make sense. I have a desire to be loved. I have a desire to be safe. I have a desire to be valued. But where am I placing that desire, what am I looking to for that desire to be fulfilled, can make it disordered, can make it out of key. If I want to be valued, that's, that's a desire, not a bad desire, but it's disordered because I think that my performance will give me value. I want to be safe, but I think that these people that are actually harmful for me, toxic relationships, will keep me safe. 
or these defense mechanisms will keep me safe. And so the desires are disordered. And so he will give you an idea that plays into your disordered desires. And then cleverly, that is normalized in a sinful society. So you get this idea, it plays into something that you do actually want. And you look around and you think, this isn't so bad. Everybody's doing this. Everybody's doing this. Everybody in the church is doing this. Our enemy is a dirty player, friends. He is not coming at us with World War tanks, tank to tank, man to man, hand to hand. It's not like that. He is defeated, and so therefore he fights dirty. (laughs) He fights like somebody who is desperate, and we need to be aware of what angle he might be coming at. The second part that I wanted to explain is what spiritual formation is. Because if we can understand spiritual formation, we can uh, understand how the devil will twist that. So Jesus explained that we are formed spiritually by spirit and truth. Jesus came as a human and as a teacher. What is a teacher? A teacher is a truth teller. They come at you with ideas that should be truth if they're a good teacher, to help us to build mental maps that correspond with reality so that we can live and thrive. That's what a teacher is. And Jesus taught that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That is what he came to bring. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But Jesus also explained when he was speaking to a Samaritan woman at a well that God is a spirit and that we have to worship him in spirit and truth. So truth is reality, but spirit is God's empowering presence in our lives. Truth alone is not enough, friends. Spirit and truth is how we are transformed. God did not just send the Word, but He sent the Word incarnate. Jesus came as a human, not just, there wasn't just a book first. There was first a person. Jesus came as the Word incarnate, who was able to be present with us, to know us, to have a relationship with us. And from that place of human relationship, of spirit relationship, he was able to give us truth. If you think about good parenting, good parenting needs to be done in spirit and truth. We're talking about spiritual formation. How do we form another little person that's been given into our care? And we need to do it, first of all, with presence. As a present, loving parent, we are there in spirit. There is a relational connection, a presence that our child feels with us. It is a loving presence. It is a good presence. It is the, the presence of a good spirit, ideally. And so the child has that, and it would be so nice if that was enough, and if we could just be the good, the good guy all the time. But parenting requires truth, too. And this truth is specifically around who God is, who the child is, and how the child should live, how how the world is. So who God is, who the child is, and how the child should live. And so a good parent is present with the child and teaching them that God is alive, that God is real, that God is loving, that God is holy, that God is just. And who the child is, that the child is valuable, that, he, that he's important, that he has something to add in this life, that he's valuable because he has the Spirit of God in him, not because he needs to perform through anything. So we, we give the child that truth about who he is and then about how he should live in this world and how he should contribute. Bad parenting lacks one or both of these things. Bad parenting, there is not presence. The parent is either absent, uh, through leaving home, working away, uh, divorce, or even through being in the home but just not being present, just being distracted. Bad parenting can also include lies over the child. Just God is not real. Nobody cares. Do whatever you like. You're useless. Lies about who the child is. You'll never amount to anything. So tired of you. You never seem to be able to make anything work. Do what you want, kiddo. Lies about the world. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares. Go for it. It's all about number one. Look after yourself. Lies form a child up in the way that they should go. So spirit and truth is the way that we are formed spiritually. Jesus, we are formed into the the image of Jesus by spirit and truth. 
and we are deformed by the devil through isolation and lies. Ideas have no effect on us until we trust them as reality. So we hear ideas all the time, but once we trust those ideas, we start to live as if they are true. That's when we're taking the directions. We're turning left, we're turning right, we're going down the road that could be the wrong road. And so when we, when we hear ideas and, and, and lies about things like, I'm only as good as I'm successful, or I'm ugly and I'm unworthy of love, or I'm a bad person, everything I do will fail, or even I'm, I'm better than everyone else because I have to be, because if I'm not, then I don't have value. These things are, are lies, and if we believe them, we start to live as if they're true, and they take us down a path that causes us to, to not thrive. T.S. Eliot said, humankind cannot bear very much reality. It takes a lot of courage to truly understand what is truth about ourselves and about the world that we live in. It takes courage. It takes time to understand those things. And it has also been written, the truth will set you free, but only once it is finished with you. <laughs> and so, yes, the truth, the truth can be difficult, and that's why spirit and truth needs to go together. We need to, friends, it is not enough to just come here on a Sunday and hear truth. It's not even enough to read your Bible every day. We need to have a relationship with the God who is able to minister to us and able to lead us into truth through love. The devil's tactic to isolate and then lie, to pick a lie that will play into our disordered desires. Not bad desires, remember, but just desires that are based on the wrong thing, desires that are looking in the wrong direction to be fulfilled. Have you ever noticed that being in the presence of a good spirit is transformative? And sometimes you'll be in the presence of someone and it'll just change you. It'll change how you think and it'll change how you feel simply because you're around that person. We become like the people that we spend time with. That is spiritual formation. We become like the truth we hear. With the things that we watch, the things that we take in, the, th the conversations we're a part of form us, friends. This is how we are formed. And this is how we are tempted. Because in amongst all of that information, all of the conversations we have, all of the truth that we're exposed to, all of the, the spirits that we're in connection with, the devil is trying to throw in information, throw in confusion, throw in a whole lot of noise so that when the lie is slipped in, you don't even notice. If it's even necessary to slip those lies in because we're already confused and distracted. But I, I know from experience that, those, that lying is his native language, and so he will slip them in. He will, he, will, he will speak his agenda into our minds when we're confused. It can be quite intimidating, and I guess this is the point where we need the way maker, because my third point is how do we overcome temptation? So we, it is intimidating. We're up against an incredibly in, intelligent enemy with a subterfuge that is beyond our intelligence, honestly. And so we're, it's, it's a confusing fight, but the great news is that the example Jesus gave us is that the, the, our tactic in order to fight and overcome temptation is amazingly simple. And so that's good news. Jesus modeled a way for us to reprogram our mental maps, to be able to put in truth in relationship with the Spirit. So we're going to talk a little bit about practices. A practice is something that you do over and over that becomes a habit that starts to form who you are. And Jesus came onto this earth as a second Adam, as a new humanity, that he was going to face the devil and do what Adam and Eve were unable to do. They were unable to overcome temptation in that moment, but Jesus was able to, and he shows us how. You notice that uh, a slight difference between the two scenarios is that Adam and Eve were in a garden. They were in a good place when they were able to be tempted and, and fell. Jesus doesn't go back to the garden and win from there because that's no use because we're already down and out. We're already in the wilderness. We're already in the desert. There's no use someone to carry on with the sporting analogy running on and saying, this is how you should have played your first half. Great. We've lost the ball. We're 50 points down. 
this is our position. How do we win from here? And so Jesus, Jesus did that. He went into the desert. He went into the wilderness. And he said, I'm going to show you how to win even from here, even if you're not starting from the garden. And so he, he started in the desert. There's a beautiful just word play. Uh, the Bible is very into words and the value of them. And the word that is used for he was led up into the desert is the same, uh, the same verb that would be used to being, for a lamb to be led to the sacrifice. So he's just been baptized. He's just been recognized by John the Baptist as, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away from the sins of the world. And then he is led up like a sacrifice to the desert to take our place, to redeem us, to swap out his soul for ours in that moment. And so that is, that is the picture that we're, that we're left with. And here, instead of eating from the tree of good, good and knowledge, he's fasting. He's, he's feasting on the Spirit of God. He's engaged in that, uh, in that practice, to use the first practice. We're not going to major on fasting, but he's done a 40-day fast where he has trained himself, overcome temptation again and again, training himself to feast on the Spirit of God. Whatever you feed grows. Whatever hunger you feed is the hunger that grows. And he's feeding his hunger spiritually so that that is the hunger that is being developed. And then the devil starts in exactly the same way. It's, it's an updated version of did God really say. He says to Jesus, if you're the son of God, and he plays on what has just happened. Jesus has just heard, you are the son of God. And in the next uh, the next encounter that he has, the next conversation he has is, if you are the son of God. It's a, did God really say? I'm going to take it, but it's like, let's just put a little bit of doubt in there. Just throw a little bit of doubt into, into what you're thinking. I'm not going to say you're not, because that's too strong. Just, okay, well, if you were, then you would be able to do this. And he, he plays into, watch this, Jesus' desires. So it's no use the devil coming to me and saying, if you're hungry, turn these stones into bread. Like, that's not a temptation for me because I really can't do it. It's, I'm not, I've never been tempted to turn stones into bread in my life. I can't do it. But Jesus could. He hadn't eaten for 40 days, and he could do it. So the devil is playing into his des desires. And if they're a little bit disordered, then he's gotten in there. And so he plays into that, and he, he plays into Jesus' desire to rescue the world. He says, I'll give it to you. I'll give it all to you. All you have to do is worship me. It's the, it's the glory without the suffering. He's playing into the things that Jesus actually wants. Three times he comes and confronts him and, and tempts him. Have you ever considered that this is a showdown between the Son of God and the enemy of the world, and there are no bolts of lightning, there's no flashes of thunder, it's a conversation. The enemy is not going to make it obvious, friends. It's not going to always be so obvious coming at you like a World War II tank. This is subterfuge. It's, it's quiet. It's sneaky. It's just a little bit of bread after 40 days. I mean, give me a break. It's, it's what you came here for, Jesus, the world. Just this way. I mean, and then he even plays into, you, you trust God. You've, you just said you trust God. Uh, that's why you won't turn the bread into, uh, the, the, the stones into bread. So if you trust him, jump off the cliff, prove it. He plays into his disordered desires. But Jesus gives us these two specific practices. Solitude, he's gone out into the desert alone, and then answers with scripture. And we're going to focus first on solitude. Notice the difference between solitude and isolation. Solitude is going out into the wilderness not to hide from something, but to find something. He's not hiding from anyone or anything. He is looking for something or for someone. He's looking for the Spirit of God, and he's looking for the truth of God. When we think about solitude, oh, Solitude, are you joking? That sounds amazing. A few days just to rest and relax and put your feet up and sleep. That's not this practice. There is a practice for rest, but it's not this one. Solitude is not a rest from the battle. Solitude is the battlefield on which the, the war is lost or won. 
It is running headlong into the battle, into the position where you can find spirit and truth. It's not having a longer nap. That's not what solitude is. Henry Novin said it like this, solitude is not a private therapeutic place. Rather, solitude is the furnace of transformation. Without solitude, we remain victims of our society and continue to be entangled in the illusions of the false self. Those deceptions, those confusions, those disordered desires, we are trapped by them, entangled in them until we go into solitude and manage to strip them away. Isolation is a classic offensive technique. We all know that. Living in South Africa, we know that that is how buck are, are eaten. They isolated and then attacked by the lion or by the, by the predator. That is, how, uh, that is an, a classic offensive technique that the devil will use. But guess what? We can use it too. We can use it on our own thoughts. That's what solitude is. It is going away so that we can isolate the thoughts that are lies and deal with them appropriately by measuring them against Scripture. If Richard and I are sitting and watching TV and the kids are around and we think we hear an intruder in our home, the first thing we do is turn the TV off. Shh, the kids, shh, the dogs. Listen. Once we have isolated the sound, identified the intruder, then we can deal with it. It's usually a rat. <laughs> maybe a cockroach, but you can only deal with it once it's isolated. That is what solitude is. It is going away from the noise for long enough for the lies to start popping up, and you, you hear yourself think something, and then you can deal with it with Scripture. That's solitude. And then the Scripture, Jesus anchored himself to Scripture. He, he aligned himself. He formed himself around scriptures. He had scriptures. He had answers for the temptations that were common to him. As I said, I am not tempted to turn st stones to bread, so I don't need an answer for that temptation. But I do have things that I'm tempted about more often than others that are my temptations, my disordered de desires, and therefore my vulnerabilities. Do you know yours? This is our homework around the scripture point. So solitude is necessary for this, but, but even without solitude, so solitude is necessary when we're able to do that over an extended period of time. But throughout the next weeks and months, however long it takes, we are going to start to write down thoughts that we have and emotions that we have. And then once they're written down, once they're exposed, notice the ones that are repeated that are lies. And then we are going to pray for and trust for a scripture that speaks to that lie. Jesus had a scripture that spoke to his disordered desires. We need to have the mind of Christ, the Bible teaches us. And it is not just to think about scripture, but it is to think scripture. It's to think those thoughts, those truths to become our truth. And so that is what we are going to practice doing. We are going to practice when this lie comes up, when this emotion and this thought comes up, I'm going to speak this scripture. I'm going to change to think this scripture. We cannot stop thinking about something. We need to start thinking about something else. And so Jesus always answered with scripture. So the two things that Jesus gave us of how to overcome temptation, even though the enemy is confusing and, and clever and well able to do his job, Jesus gave us a simple way that we can do ours, a way maker of how we could be better humans. In solitude, we isolate our thoughts that are lies, and then we find the scriptures that match to those thoughts, and we fight with those scriptures by thinking that instead of the confusion, the temptations, and the lies that the enemy comes at us with. Mm -hmm.